All right, so uh, this is a, first of all, I want to thank Sonia for her help putting this together. This is an idea that Steve and I have, uh, have been working on since early last year, and uh, she helped us put this presentation together, so thank you very much. But what we're uh, passionate about is helping you know, individuals start with their first job and they're, they're enter into a career. We, of course, we're in IT, so that's our focus, but like Steve said, these tips could apply to, uh, to any uh, job search opportunity that you've got. So what we're going to do today is go over a couple of agenda items. So we're going to talk about writing your resumes. So we'll give you some tips and suggestions on how you can make your resume, you know, a little cleaner, a little more noticeable uh, for a hiring manager. We're going to talk about job fairs and standing out at a, a job fair. We meet a lot of our candidates that way, uh, job fairs or conventions. Uh, how to prepare for an interview. And then we're going to talk about the day of the interview itself. We're gonna talk about behavioral style interviews, which is a particular type of interview that, that FedEx utilizes and a lot of major companies utilize it. And it's something we see a lot of entry-level candidates struggle with. And with a few simple tips, uh, we think you can be a lot more effective and prepared uh, to present yourself in your best light during that interview. We're gonna talk about what to do after the interview. And then we have some additional information related to FedEx's internship opportunities. Uh, to share with you and then we'll do a question and answer. We will stop a couple of times along the way to ask for questions as well so you don't have to save all your questions for the end. So with that we'll get started. Steve why don't you talk to us about resumes. Okay so I wanted to give you a few tips about resumes. So first of all these aren't the only tips that are out there and there's a lot of opinions on how to do things. I'm just going to share with you some experiences that we've had and how we sort of go through the resumes that we pick. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to get, you know, hundreds of resumes uh, for some of our job postings. Uh, a recent job posting I had for internships last summer, I received over 400. And so when you have 400 and you're a person that's going through resumes and you're trying to figure out who you want to talk to for an interview, you're looking for some key items so that you can get through them quickly. So one of the things to think about is, and we're going to talk about a job description in just a second, but consider, you know, what job you're going for and look for what the employer is writing down in their job ad. And, and look at your resume and determine, does your resume really fit uh, for, for that description of what they're asking for? Um, make, you can make some adjustments to that. And you may also uh, have more than one resume depending on what you're trying to go for. So in information technology, we have different positions. We have uh, you know, positions that we have for scrum masters, business analysts, uh, developers, uh, testers. And coming out of school, you know, those may pique your interest in different ways and different companies may have different opportunities available. So you may have a different resume for each one of those paths that you might be interested in. Um, employers really understand when you're coming out of school that you don't have a lot of job experience. So it's not um, important to really embellish your resume with a lot of things that aren't really relevant or things that you didn't do. So you don't have to fabricate something or pretend to be something that you're not because we recognize that most of your experience is gonna come from schoolwork. Another thing to do with your resume is to really be neat and concise and be accurate in the descriptions that you're putting there. Um, a, a big tip is to order the skills that you're most familiar with first and try to align those with what the job description is asking for. Uh, since most people read top to bottom and left to right, you know, we're going to be looking for relevant things from the top going down and to the left to the right. Uh, if something like skills are all listed in order, uh, if we see a skill that's the very last one listed, we may think that you don't have that as a primary skill or it's not one of your specialties. So pay attention to how you're ordering things and putting the most important things that you want the employer to know and spots that they're going to see it. And we're going to talk about a couple of resumes and I'll show you some examples in a second. Uh, keep a resume that's really clean. Uh, don't distract it with adding a bunch of different colors, fonts, uh, graphics, uh, pictures of yourself. Uh, those things don't add a lot of value to your resume uh, at the point where you're getting into the job market. Uh, what you're really interested in is, is showing that employer what you have and uh, you know, what skills you can bring to the table. Really understand what's on your resume. You're going to be asked to talk about it in an interview. So make sure that anything that you put there, you can back up with some kind of uh, facts or stories. Uh, proofread it. Uh, read it aloud. Ask people that you know that are good proofreaders to look it over for you for punctuation and grammar uh, errors. 
And if you have friends or family that are in the business uh, that you're looking towards, ask them to give you a, a critique of it as well. Uh, an important thing to also recognize is, is that, you know, we, we call them bots, but they're screening your resume. So they're looking for keywords. And so if you're looking at a job description and you're trying to push your resume through and get considered for a job opportunity, if you don't have the keywords that are in the job description in your resume, it's probably not going to get uh, pulled to even be evaluated at all. So that's something else to keep in mind. Here we have a job posting. Uh, this is one that we use uh, at FedEx. Uh, what I wanna point out here is, is that we're looking for computer developers that have strong Java, which is a computer language uh, for development skills. Uh, we're asking them to be familiar with safe development methodology. In this instance, you know, a college student may not know what safe is because it's not something that's used in the college environment. So I'd suggest that when you don't know something, Google it. Because if you Googled safe, you might find that it's stands for Scaled Agile Framework. And many uh, development programs at school uh, use Agile. And so there is a correlation between Agile and Scaled Agile. Um, Agile is for singular teams, whereas Scaled Agile is multiple teams all coming together. Um, another thing that I point out on this job description is this is looking for strong written and verbal communication skills. Um, your resume is your first contact with the employer. So you really wanna make sure that you've proofread that resume and you're showing that you can have thoughts that are complete in the sentences that do the descriptions of what you've done and you know, highlight those things. Uh, he, here's an example of a resume. I'm gonna pop it into a, a bigger format here in just a second that, that we've received. Uh, the, the two that we're gonna show you are uh, very similar to some that we've had. We've mocked them up a little bit differently so that they uh, don't really apply to a particular person. So you won't find the people that these belong to because there's no William Blake Jenkins out there that has a resume that looks like this. Um, but a couple of problems with this right off the bat that gets it passed over is you can see that they didn't use proper capitalization in, in here. They've used multiple colors. Uh, there are grammar errors in here as well as you, as you see this. And remember that job posting that we just looked at a couple of minutes ago indicated that we wanted strong written skills. And so before this person even gets started, they've already been passed over because they've proven that they, they don't have that and probably the most important document that they need to get into the employer's door. If you contrast that resume with this resume, you'll see that there are some key things that this person did. Uh, they didn't have experience. So what they did was is they topped it off with education. Now, there's a debate of whether you need a summary or an objective as the first thing or education uh, or, or another topic at the top. And I think that that's a personal preference. I know that Doug and I aren't really um, concerned with what we see as, as an objective or a summary at the top, uh, because if they've applied for our job, we're, we're understanding that they're already interested in what we have to offer. So what we're looking for is education items. Um, and then because this person didn't have real world work experience, uh, they listed relevant coursework and relevant experience up front, which is what you'd expect to have from a college student. So for this person, they listed their relevant coursework as classes. And then under relevant experience, they gave a, a high level um, one sentence of what the projects were, and then one or two bullet points with a brief description of what the projects would do. This person also put Java at the end of the first uh, groupings so that we could see what languages and tools that they used. And so that really helps us when we're looking at it again from top to bottom, left to right, to see what this person has. You'll notice that the next thing that they put on the resume was work experience. And the work experience that they have has nothing to do with an information technology job. And they also put extracurricular involvement here. While those things are not information technology related, they demonstrate that this person had the ability to balance both work and either uh, extracurricular activities and perhaps uh, school all at the same time. The one thing that I'd change on this resume, if it were my resume, I would have probably listed the skills at the top. But, be, but this worked for this person and we pulled this person in for an interview who did get selected for a position. Uh, simply because at the top, I could understand the relevant coursework and relevant experience with the tool set that we were looking for towards the job description. So 
again, there's multiple ways to do a resume, but your objective is to get yourself pulled out of a pool of hundreds. And how do you do that? You first get past the bots by listing things that are in your resume uh, to what the job description is looking for. Then you order your resume with the things that you want the employer to know as how it aligns to their job description. And then you have a neat, clear, and concise resume that you proofread and asked other people to give you uh, some feedback on. And I'd like to pause for a couple of minutes or a few seconds and, and ask if, what questions do you have? When you're thinking about your questions, let me jump in with one more comment. You'll notice that on this resume, the candidate included their GPA. Uh, that's a controversial topic. Should you include your GPA or not? Uh, you don't have to, uh, but I can, I'll be honest with you. As an employer, when I'm reviewing, like uh, Steve said, hundreds of resumes, when I see one that doesn't list their GPA, I have to assume that it's below three. So if, if that's not your intention, if you've got a stronger GPA than that, I think it's to your benefit to list it. Uh, the other thing I would recommend is uh, sometimes a student will start their academic career and struggle with some of the general education courses as they mature and get used to uh, the uh, program that they're in, but then they do very well in once they get into their uh, major classes. So if you have a, a lower overall GPA, but your in-major GPA is, is much stronger, I would list them both. Because that that is something I can look at and see that you're you're done well in the courses that are most pertinent to uh, the job that we're posting for. Thank you, Doug. Uh, one other thing I forgot to point out uh, that we that we get questions on in, in some of these sessions that we do is what happens when I have job experience? Should I leave my school work up front or should I put job experience? Once you get job experience in the field that you're pursuing, you're going to want to make that a priority over schoolwork. Uh, an exception that I've seen, and again, it's personal preference at this point, is when master students are coming back. So they've, they've got a bachelor degree, they've worked in the field for a while, and now they're going back to their to get their, their master's. And what normally happens with those people is they will look and see what's more relevant to the job. So is the, the coursework I'm taking for my master program more relevant or is the, the job that I just left uh, to, go, to go pursue my, um, my uh, higher level degree more relevant? And you'll just have to decide again, you know, you're trying to match your job descriptions uh, to what's on your resume and what's important and what you want the employer to know to make that decision. But, but anytime that you are, you are just in the workforce and you're moving forward, you would want to make your uh, work experience that's in your field a higher priority than the relevant coursework that you did in school. We also have a question in the chat box. If you have the chance, is it preferred to have a resume given in person or online? Well, here, so I would always recommend if you get a chance to hand somebody your resume that you do that. I'll caveat that with at FedEx, I can accept no resumes for bringing people in for an interview that have not formally applied for a position and submitted their resume through the online uh, portals that we have. Uh, the reason for that is, is that people would get an unfair advantage if they just handed resumes to come in. What happens though, if you give somebody your resume is that, and you've applied, what I can do is, is I can ask for that resume from our HR department, because again, there's hundreds of them out there. And then I can see what you've actually submitted. So if you get a chance, you should do that. But I would also highly recommend that you follow through and also push that resume online. Thank you for that, Steve. More questions before we move on? So I see a question, what about if you have a career in IT, but it's not the same as the study program? So uh, Belinda, I'd be curious to understand um, more about that question. Can you elaborate just a little bit?
Steve, it looks like what she said was that um, she is working on an AA focused in business administration and management, but um, her background, her career has been in IT. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, what the that's a different, that's a different oh. person, Matina. It's Belinda that's asking the question. Let me see. Belinda, can you unmute and you can ask the question verbally? I just allowed you those permissions. Oh, okay. You can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I've been working with, uh, in computer operations for probably 15 years or more, but I've always liked programming. So I was laid off for a while. So I decided to go and pursue that, uh, studying that. But because I've been laid off, I'm over 50, I've been laid off <laughs> and I'm studying something like it's not exactly completely different, but it's not exactly the same career. How would my resume, how, how would it, how, what would I need to do to get, I don't know, consider with that background? So, oh, no. yeah, <laughs> it's kind of Melinda, difficult. we're kindred spirits because I was a computer operator when I was in the military and I struggled exactly with what you're struggling with right now when I first got into the job market. And, you know, what you're trying to do is separate yourself from being a computer operator and, and now trying to be uh, considered for a computer programming position. And exactly, but I, I'm not finished my study yet. Uh, 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 excuse me, either. Right, well, you so if you haven't, so if you're looking for an internship and you've got a graduation that's pending, what you would, what you would do is, is you probably list the relevant coursework first. Because again, you want to draw that employer's attention to the fact that you're going to be a recent graduate. Um, because, uh, and again, I, you know, it's, you're in a difficult situation. So a lot of what we're talking about is tailored to people just entering in the job market. But if it were me, and it has been me, I probably would list my graduation date with the, the field of study and the relevant coursework that looks like what the employer is looking for first. And then I would also follow up right after that with my relevant job experience of where you've been because your your computer operations experience is still valuable you know you've had to restart jobs you understand processes you understand data and so now you've just taken the next step to to, to get more formal uh, coding experience so so if it was me that's how i would probably present myself um you know i presented myself that way you know 35 years ago um so i'm, I'm over 50 now <laughs> but but back then i was you know, six years of computer operations experience going back to school to do what you did. And that's how I did it then. And that's what helped me. So this format that, that is up here that includes the GPA and all of that, I would, I should do that? I think that if you're looking for getting into the field that I would probably do that because you're changing fields and you want to draw attention, excuse me, to where you're headed, not where you've been. So the coursework, just put on there the, the things that I have taken already that's relevant to you know the position. Yes, yes. Okay. and what we're going to do, Doug's going to talk a little bit in a while about um, you know telling the stories about your courses and things like that. And so these these items that you see here that this person listed under relevant experience, which is their coursework, you may put you could put relevant coursework here and have listed those classes and the projects and not use the word experience. Okay, okay. If that makes any sense. Would it look too jumbled though? I think that if you spent some time working with formatting and everything, you'd, you'd find a way to make balance on it. Okay. Because we see, we, we see a lot of them. It's just a matter of balance. Okay. How far back do I need to put my resume again because I haven't been working for a while? Well, I think that you are going to have to explain a gap in employment anyway. Right. So, um, you know, there's no problem with having that gap there. And people are going to see that you uh, left the workforce in, you know, whatever year, and then you started college in a different year. I don't believe anybody who's looking at an entry level position is going to hold that against you. Um, the most important thing, though, and I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody on this uh, call, if you have uh, gaps in employment, when you fill out that job application, make sure you list those gaps and talk about if they give you an opportunity to tell you, you know, put something there to do it. I've seen where people have, you know, only had a job for a month and then they didn't list it. 
when they do a background check, they find it. And because it wasn't truthful on the res on the job application, the per the people have been let go over the years. You know, so that's an important thing to do. So again, I wouldn't worry about that. There's a gap there as much as making sure you have the truth. So on, you don't on have to put the truth that you got laid off, right? You just have to put the beginning and end dates of the of the time that you were employed. Okay, and wait. If I get an interview, wait to explain when necessary. They may not even ask you. Oh, I'm looking for where we, where you're headed. I'm not worried about you know what you did ten years ago as much as what you're doing right now. So if you're coming out of school, and uh, you've got the experience that we're looking for from school, then that's where we're starting. Cool. Thank you, Craig. Thank you guys. I know um, Sonia has a couple more questions that she's going to mention too, but I just want to let all the attendees know that if you are interested in asking questions verbally, uh, please just let me know in the chat box and I can unmute you so if that's a little bit easier, just like what took place with Belinda. Okay, Steve, we got a question. It says, should you change your resume for each job application? Well, I think that you should consider looking at what the job description is asking for. And then if you need to tweak your resume, you should do that. Again, you're, 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 what you're, what's your objective? Your objective is to get noticed and get that interview. And so if you have a, a, a resume that doesn't look like what the job description has, uh, and, I ha and, and, and I'll just use myself. If I have 400, I'm not looking at it twice. I've got you know, 399 more that look like what I'm looking for probably. And so I'm moving on. Okay, the next question is, are there any skills that you would define as transferable that would be safe on a resume? Well, are you talking about the experience with Microsoft Word or something like that? I think that those kinds of skills might be transferable. I think that uh, in the information technology space, um, let's say that you had been an accountant at some point in time and there's a job posting for an information technology uh, position where you're going to support an accounting group. Um, and now you've got a, a degree or you're pursuing a degree in information technology. I think that those are transferable kinds of skills that, you know, would help, you know, make you a stronger candidate for a position you know, in an area that was going to use uh, information technology to support it. Thanks, Steve. Okay, well, we, we can uh, take some more questions at the end, if that's okay. Uh, Doug's got quite a bit of material to go through, and I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to go through it. And we definitely, I don't mind staying late after this um, to answer any more questions that you might think of. So if it's okay with everyone, I'm gonna move forward. Okay, let's talk about standing out at job fairs or conventions. This is how we meet a lot of our candidates. Uh, we, we go to school job fairs, we go to uh, large conventions like National Society of Women Engineers, uh, National Society of Black Engineers. There's a number of conventions like that. Uh, they're typically pretty large and there's a number of employers there and a large number of uh, uh, students that are uh, milling about when it's in person and, and coming into your chat rooms when they're virtual. So a couple tips for that. Uh, first of all, memorize a little short story about yourself. This is what you're gonna use when you introduce yourself to each of the potential employers. What's your name? Where are you from? What college do you attend? Have you graduated? Do you, when do you plan to graduate? What's your major? And what are you passionate about as far as your career? So if, if you're a person who has gotten into you know, computer programming because you love doing it, you do it as a hobby and you, you write games on weekends or something, let them know that. That is That could be a difference maker uh, between you and the 100 other people that they're going to meet that day uh, you know, as far as uh, opening. So if you, if you have a passion about your career, be sure to express it. Bring multiple copies of your resume. You're going to meet a number of employers at, at these type of events and you don't want to run out. You don't want to you know, hand out a bunch of your resumes and then hit a, a particular employer that you really are interested in and you don't have a resume to hand out. Right? Be sure to smile, be personable uh, when you, you know, approach them and talk to as many of these companies as you can. I, I know a year ago I was in California for the 
uh, National Society of Women Engineers and FedEx had a booth and there was probably a hundred other companies there that had booths as well. And a large number of students were, were passing by. And I, I noticed a, there was a number of students that would walk up, look at the FedEx booth for a second, hesitate, and then they would walk away. And so after I saw a couple of those, I started engaging with those, those students. So they'd walk up, they'd hesitate and look, I would step forward, introduce myself and ask them what their major was. Sometimes they were an IT major and, and, and I would say, oh, okay, well, we've got IT openings and I start to talk to them about that. And I kept getting the same response from them of, oh, wow, well, I knew FedEx was a big company. I know you, you have a lot to do with logistics and movement of packages, but I didn't realize you had uh, such an IT you know, involvement. And that's what it takes to move those packages is, is some strong IT applications and a lot of technology that you may not realize. And you're gonna encounter that with a lot of companies. You may walk up to a Caterpillar booth and think, oh, they're a big heavy equipment manufacturer. Yeah, well, I bet they also have a lot of uh, IT applications behind the scenes that will enable that to happen. So you never know which company you're going to encounter that might have the, the culture and the opportunity that is going to really excite you. So engage as many of these companies as you can and have enough resumes on hand that you can uh, distribute to the ones that you're interested in. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, you know, don't wait for like the candidates I talk to that are, you know, for me to approach you. You know, step forward, you know, uh, depending upon what's socially acceptable at the time, uh, you know, shake hands, fist bump, elbow bump, or just wave at them, whatever, right? But, you know, start to initiate the conversation, you know, good morning, how are you? Uh, you know, I have some questions about your company. They'd love to hear uh, things like that. Um, ask them about their role in the company. Ask them what they do, what the companies like to work for. You can get some great information about the culture of that particular company from those responses. And, figure out if that's a place that you're interested in working at or not. All right, utilize your little short story that we talked about. Uh, let them know that you're interested in applying. If they have one of their openings, it sounds great to you. Uh, hand them a resume. If not, if they don't have an opening that sounds great to you at this time, if, but they sound like a company you might be interested in, ask if you can leave a copy of your resume anyway. Because sometimes what will happen is though these companies will leave this big event, and maybe two weeks later, a, a new opening opens up and if they've got your resume then you'll be in the pool of candidates that they review for that, that new opportunity that didn't even exist when you were at the conference itself so don't hesitate to do that and of course end your conversation with them some nice pleasantries nice to meet you you know thanks for information you know that type of thing okay all right so now you've you've gone to some event or you've applied for a job and you've got an interview scheduled. So what do you need to do to prepare for it? What I see a, a large number of our candidates do is nothing. They, they, they come in and they try and wing it in the interview. Please don't be that person. You need to do a couple of things before you, you show up for your interview. And one of them is some company research. This is a big difference maker for you when you have your interview. You don't want to be the person that walks in and doesn't know anything about FedEx or knows just what they know from seeing packages delivered at their house. Any company that you are interested in interviewing with of any size is going to have a website. And on their website, they're going to have an about our company uh, link somewhere on there. Find that, click on it. It's going to be loaded with information that that company wants you to know. And you can look through that. It only takes five, 10 minutes and you can come up with half a dozen interesting things that strike your interest that you can either use as questions or that you can incorporate into your answers. It will give you a lot of great information. So I've got a couple different examples here from the, the FedEx site. So I just went in here, it, it again, took me just a couple minutes, hopped in, took a look. If you're interested in, you know, concerned about, you know, global warming and CO2 emissions, hey, there's some information there about what FedEx is doing. That may be of interest to you. If you're curious how many packages FedEx handles on a day, there's information about that. There's a section on awards and recognitions. I would highly recommend you check these out. This will give you a great insight into what the company values and what their culture is like uh, working for them. So see what kind of awards they're getting. You know, are, are they getting on winning awards for best place to work or, you know, that type of thing can be valuable to you when you have multiple offers. Uh, we're talking mainly about IT majors here, so 
I, there's a video on the FedEx One about technology and innovation. And so this video will explain to you what we're doing with drones, robots. You know, so there's a lot of cool things that you have, probably have no idea that FedEx is uh, works with uh, that might strike your interest and give you something that you can ask questions or talk about. There's a video there about FedEx culture, what it's like to work at FedEx. So again, you can get some great insight into what are the things the company values in, in terms of how they treat their people and the, the values of, of the organization. And there's also a section in there about the history of the company. So that may strike your interest, you know, um, how did the company get started? What is the, the history of it? So by looking at that, you can come up with a few questions and then you can have those ready when you show up for the interview. And it's going to show the interviewer that you showed enough initiative and had enough interest in their company to spend a few minutes doing that type of research. And that can be a big difference maker for you on the interview. All right, so what else do you need to do to prepare for your interview? First of all, I want you to review that job posting. I've actually had candidates that have showed up that weren't sure what job they were interviewing for or where the job location was. Don't be that person. Spend some time, look it over, know what they're looking for. If they're looking for a Java developer with agile experience, then you want to make sure that you know your experience in those areas that you can try and you utilize when you're answering the questions to illustrate that you've got that background, that you're the type of candidate they're looking for. Prepare yourself a story, okay? This is probably the biggest single tip that I can give you today. This could be a huge difference maker. Before your interview, I want you to sit down and think of a couple stories of projects that you've worked on that could be used as background for the answering the questions. So think about a project group project you worked on in school. What, what was the project about? What happened in the project? What did you do in that project? What were the results of the project? If you can get a couple of those in your head, it makes a huge difference. Because what you're going to find, we see a lot, is can't, we'll ask questions of a candidate and then you can, they try to come up on the fly with some way to relate that information to us. Stories resonate a lot better than facts. And if you're having to do it on the fly, it can be frustrating and you can, you can lock up. You don't care like a deer in headlights at one point. So if you've got a couple of these memorized, you can draw and that candidates write them down and show up for the interview. And we ask them a question and they'll look, you can see they're looking on their list and uh, I'm going to go with question number two. That's cool. You know, that still shows that they've had enough foresight to think through this and are prepared to answer those type of questions. So think about how those stories can apply to your job posting. Think about what you learned, what you did well, you know, how you showed initiative, what was the outcome, that type of thing. Then I want you to always come prepared with questions. I guarantee that any interview you have is going to finish with the interviewer asking you what questions you've got for them. And way too many candidates will look at us and say, I've got nothing. Don't be that person, right? This is a, your last opportunity to differentiate yourself from the other candidates that are interviewing. Use some questions. Take that research that we talked about on the previous slide. If there's something in there that piques your interest and it hasn't come out through the course of the questions that the interviewer asked, this is the time. Jump out there and say, Hey, can you know you tell me about how FedEx is reducing emissions? Can you tell me about you know 15 million packages a day? Well, that's a lot. How how does that work, right? Those type of things will can be a difference maker for you and wrap up the interview on a good note. And practice builds confidence. Before you show up for your interview, I want you to grab a friend, a family member, somebody who could who's willing to sit down with you and practice an interview. So I want you going over questions using your stories, putting together good answers that talk about what happened, how you approached that issue, and what the results were. Okay. On the day of the interview, if it's an in-person interview, I want you to plan to arrive early and allow time for unexpected things. You might encounter traffic, you, there might be an accident. You may think you know the best route to get there based upon the time of day. However, it may not be. So make sure you, you build in a buffer there so that you're not showing up late for the interview. If you get there too early, 
you can always sit in your car and practice your interview to yourself and build your confidence and be prepared for that interview. So I want you there 10 or 15 minutes early, but please don't be the person that shows up an hour early, right? Because we're, we're busy, we've got other interviews scheduled, we, we have other activities that are part of our day job and we won't be able to meet with you at that earlier time. So what will happen is the receptionist will call me, I'll tell them, keep them in the lobby, I'll be down as soon as I can, and you'll spend an hour just sitting in the lobby, getting nervous, and you won't be able to present your best side as well as you could. Virtual interviews, similar. I want you there early. You don't have to be quite as early because obviously you don't have to worry about traffic, but I do want you on a few minutes early so that you can check the connection. If they're using Zoom or WebEx or whatever technology the interviewers are using, make sure that you're in a place where you can, you can hook up, you've got good Wi-Fi, you've got a good connection, and that you can get into the, the interview. If you can't, let the interviewers know right away. Please don't be the person that leaves Steve or I sitting there wondering if you're going to show up or not. That's not a good start to your interview. So let us know if you're having technical issues, and we understand that, and we'll, we'll help you through it. Make sure you pick a quiet place for this interview. Uh, we've had candidates that have interviewed with us in like commons areas at school where there's loud, lots of activity going on. Uh, we've had uh, students that tried to interview with us in an outdoor location, but there's a, it's near a street and you can hear cars going by constantly. It makes it difficult for us to understand your responses and it makes it difficult for you to understand the questions. So find a nice quiet place where you won't be interrupted so that we can conduct the interview. Okay? During the interview, smile while you talk. It makes a big difference. It, it's going to make you look more confident uh, as, as, and approachable as you're doing the interview. Even if it's a remote interview and they're not using a camera, I want you to smile because you, it'll come through in your voice. It will be, it'll be detected. Okay, introduce yourself, recite your story. I want you to stay calm. I see way too many students who will interview with us and maybe you missed the first question. And then what happens is we'll offer to come back to that one. Uh, and you know we'll try and coach you down and get you back on target. But I see way too many candidates that freeze at that point. They know they blew the first question and they, they are unable to let it go. And they start, it affects subsequent questions and the wheels come off and the interview just gets worse and worse and worse. So please don't be that person. The interviewers have been in your shoes before. They know you're nervous. So let it go and then focus on the next question. Make sure you, you do as well as you can on, this, on the subsequent ones. Listen to the question and repeat it back. Here's a great tip because it gives you a few extra seconds to think about your answer and it makes certain that you understand the question before you start. Because you don't want to go rambling off on some answer that really isn't pertinent to the question that's being asked. Uh, so this, this gives you a little bit of time to think and it makes sure that you confirm you're answering the correct question. And we want you to answer in a concise manner in the format of what happened, how we approached that issue and what was the results. So be specific. We get a lot of candidates that'll talk to us about a, a group project they're on. We're going to end up drilling into that to find out what was your role in that project. So explain that right up front. Say, I was on a project team of four. We built this great, cool project. And I was the one that did the front end work, or I did the back end, or I did the database. So whatever your role was, point that out so we know exactly what you did on the project, not just what the team did. And then at the end, ask your questions, right? So don't be the person, like I said, that exits the interview with, I don't have any questions. At a minimum, you should ask them, what are the next steps? Because you know, Steve and I may interview some candidates, may interview today. We may be interviewing for the next two weeks on that same position. And then HR may need another week or two or three in order to uh, put us in a position where we can make an offer. So ask what the timeline is, because you don't want to be sitting there nervous or thinking that you blew the interview when that's, it's the process is going to take a certain period of time. Okay, let's talk about behavioral style interviews. So this again was what FedEx uses. A lot of major corporations use this. There are going to be questions along the lines of this. Uh, give me an example of a time 
where you've demonstrated initiative on a project at school. Okay. This is where your stories come in. If you've got a couple of stories in your mind that you can reference, all you have to do is pick one of those stories and then think about how do I address the question using that story. And we know for an entry level position coming out of school, you're not going to have a lot of experience. You can even use the same story on multiple questions. If I asked you about initiative, you can tell me there was this project I worked on and these are the things I did that showed initiative. Great. I can ask you later, tell me about an example of teamwork. You can use that same story again and say, I was on this project. We, I talked about it earlier. This is what we built. From a teamwork standpoint, this is what happened. This is what I did. This was the results, right? So all you have to do is to have those stories you can reference. It'll keep you from having to think something up on the fly. Because that's what I see happen way too often is the candidate will try and come up with something and they, they get nervous and then they lock up and they're unable to address the question. Right? Don't try and bluff us with non-relevant answers. So, so if you don't understand the question, ask us. Ask for clarification, ask for rephrasing, but don't go rambling off to try and dance around the, the question because it won't work and it, it isn't impressive. Another big one, particularly on virtual interviews, uh, we tend not to use video because we want to make it an even playing field for everybody. Uh, so we'll just it'll just be an, an audio interview with us. And what we have candidates who will try and Google terms. So we will ask them something and you may think, well, it's not video. They don't know what I'm doing. We, we know what you're doing. It's, it's obvious. So we'll hear it. We'll hear the candidate pause. We'll hear a click, 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 click on the keys. And then they'll we'll read us an answer that doesn't sound like something they would naturally say. You've Googled it and we know it. And that's not a good thing. Again, I talked about being, you know, if you get rattled, you miss an answer, let it go. Refocus, get the rest of the questions correct. Expect to be, have additional background questions asked. So we're going to drill in to find out what exactly your skills are and what your background is. So if you tell us you worked on this certain project as a uh, front end developer and it, it turned out fantastic, expect that we're going to ask you, what language did you use? when you did that front end development. And you may say, well, I did it in Angular. Me, did you know Angular before you started the project? Well, no. How did you learn it? So we're gonna ask questions like that to, to see how deep your knowledge really is, right? Uh, so expect that. Uh, do, again, I already talked about clarification or rephrasing. Uh, smile, be personable. Uh, keep your communications clear and concise. Our interviews are only generally an hour long. And uh, we've got to get in a number of questions, so we can't allow you to talk too long on any given topic. So try and keep your answers three to five minutes, because we will have to interrupt you if it goes longer than that and try and refocus you uh, back on the, the question. Uh, so do have your stories prepared. And uh, that's kind of, I already gave you the format, you know, give me an example of, so what we're looking for is what was the situation, how you addressed it, and what was the result. And you can even give us a story with a bad result if you spin your learnings into it, right? So you can say, yeah, I was on this project and it was a total train wreck um, because we had, you know, some teamwork issues with, the, you know, some of the other team members that wouldn't pull their weight. But what I learned through that process was, and then use that to answer your question. So those are, are good ones as well. Okay, any questions before we move further on this? Okay. Excuse me, Douglas Klinger. Yes. Sometimes I tend to ramble on when I'm nervous. Yeah. <laughs> how how can you get yourself back away from that? Well, first of all, we, we will stop you if you start to do that. Uh, we have a lot of candidates that will do that. Like you said, it's a it's a nervous habit, you know. So they'll start talking and rambling, and and then we'll we'll interject and we warn you up front in our interviews that we're not trying to be rude, you know, but. We, we will interject and say, you know, excuse me, but, you know, can we go back and do this? So what I would recommend is you stick to that format. If you, if you stick to what was the situation, how I addressed it, and what were the results, that's pretty short and concise. And it'll keep you from rambling on in too much detail. 
let the interviewer drill into any additional details they want to know. And it might save you from accidentally exposing something that you know you didn't want to want them to know. And it'll it'll put the work on them, right? And it'll keep you from sounding like you're nervous or angry. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also add to that, Doug. Uh, we mentioned you mentioned it earlier is uh, writing down those stories and the things that you did. And so having those in front of you where they're easy to get to and easy to see. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong coming to an interview with a set, a couple of notes that you can look at. And so, if you've talked about what you, you know, if you look at the projects that you did, what it was, how did it, you know, how did you go about it, and what the result was, and you've got two or three of those right in front of you, it's going to help you stay focused as well because it's right there, and you can keep looking at it. Good point. Suppose you think the interview, your part of it, is not going well. You did something. You think you messed up. Is it okay to walk away, you know, however? What I would do is like we talked about, I, I would not get nervous about it. I wouldn't overthink it. We're gonna talk in a minute about what to do after an interview and, and analyze, you know, how it went for you, but don't let it make the current situation worse, right? You may have feel like you totally screwed up that first question. You may not, we may be very happy with or content with that answer. You, so don't judge yourself during the interview. Answer the questions, do the best you can, and take each question one at a time. Don't let any problems you had with an earlier question interfere with the next question. What do you feel about people in face-to-face -face interviews actually looking at you? It's some people that don't like you to stare at them. You know, when they, myself, I look at people in their eyes when they speak to me. Some people feel a little intimidated by that. And so I was told not to like stare, kind of turn away. How does that look upon you guys? I, I would prefer you to make eye contact during the interview. It shows you're engaged and interested in participating in the, the interview process. Um, if the, of course, if the interviewer, you know, you, you, you're observing them too, right? So if you're in person and, and you see them acting nervous or awkward, you know, then, you, then you may want to adjust your body language and in contact, but I think it's always a good idea to make eye contact. Thank you, sounds good. Uh, one other point that we talk about, uh, you, we can relate here, is think about within your stories, right? So your, your story may have, if you can apply it to that particular company, it has more power, right? So uh, we get a lot of students to come to us with a traveling salesperson story. And you know they, they describe what they did, but think about the company. If you're if you're interviewing at FedEx and your project was how to most efficiently move a salesperson from one place to another and you know get the most you know efficient route, that, doesn't that sound a lot like what FedEx might be doing with packages? You know we have multiple customers to visit in the course of a route, and you know we want to be the most efficient route as possible. So you can you can spin that and apply it. It, it will add a lot to your story. All right, let's, let's say, talk about after the interview. So you, you finished your interview. First thing I want you to do is get up and walk away. Clear your head, grab a cup of coffee, a soft drink, energy drink, whatever you want. Relax yourself for a few minutes. And then I want you to sit down and take some notes. I want you to write down what went well, what didn't go as well as you would like it to have gone. What can you emphasize in terms of your strengths next time? What can you do to improve upon the areas that you felt were weak? Right? Make each interview a learning experience. Even if you totally blow this interview horribly, learn something from it. So that when you have a subsequent interview, either with the same company or a different company, you can present yourself stronger than you did the first time around. And I, I think that's a key. Then I want you to do a follow up with your interviewers. So some of our candidates do this, some of them don't, but I think it's a, a good touch to send an, an email thanking them for the, the interview opportunity and then asking them you know, if they have any additional questions or, or any information about the, uh, the time on our follow up, right? It shows that you're interested and engaged and, it, you know, it probably won't make a difference in the hiring decision, but it could. If we were deadlocked on two candidates and couldn't decide and one of them sends us a nice thank you and the other one doesn't, 
that might be the difference. You never know. Here's a huge one. Check your email. Okay, we email is how businesses communicate. Email is something you supplied as part of your resume and your application. That's how HR is going to reach out to you. I, it's amazing how many times we will interview, we'll select our candidate, we'll tell HR to make an offer, HR will submit the offer, and they always have a timeline on them. So your offer is going to say, you know, good for the next seven days, you know, this is the job offer, right? On day six, we will, Steve or I will get a call from HR saying, we haven't heard anything from your candidate. And then we end up calling them and saying, hey, you know, we had sent that job offer to you last week. You know, what, what are your thoughts? And they almost always say, oh my gosh, I haven't even looked at my email, right? Don't be that person. You know, you've interviewed with a company, you know, companies communicate via email. You know, you gave them your email, check it frequently after the interview. They may have follow-up questions. They may need additional information on your background. Don't let that stall your process. You know, don't be the one who actually gets the job offer and then loses it because they didn't respond in time. So uh, that would be a big tip. A lot of uh, candidates will ask me if it's okay to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And I always say, yeah, uh, I'm going, you're gonna have my email address as part of the interview process. And you're gonna have a, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you want. Either one, as long as you've got some way to maintain contact, because you wanna be able to reach out to that interviewing manager a week, two weeks, three weeks afterwards, and, and just say, hi, have you made a decision? Yeah, what's the process, you know? And uh, yeah, I think it's always good to have those connections and, and networks. All right, we got some additional information for you. So first talking generally about internships, I think they're fantastic. This is, internships are a great opportunity for a win-win. So you can get in and see what the company's about, what their work culture is, what type of work you do. And the company gets to see about you. What's your work ethic? You know, what skills do you have? So it's a great opportunity as, as a student to be able to get into a, a real life work environment and spend some time with some employees and managers in, in that environment. So like our opportunities are usually a 10 week program. We typically run from June to August. Uh, this year is a little different uh, because of the COVID situation. So we've got a couple of interns that started with us in September. We've got another batch that's going to be starting with us in January. Uh, we're planning to have an, a, another group of interns next summer in June. And there's a lot of discussion as we have gotten used to this virtual world, you know, maybe we open this up and it becomes a year round type of thing. So I'm gonna, there's a link there to, uh, we're gonna share on, you know, how to apply for a, the FedEx interns that are ships that are available. Uh, we are accepting applications right now for the June program. So I would suggest you check that frequently, you know. So if you apply and maybe the June one doesn't work out, we may be offering additional opportunities later in the year. So. Save that link and uh, receive posted into the chat there and uh, keep following back up on it. Hey Doug, we've got a question about how internships are handled during COVID. Uh, yeah. Just a heads up, we, uh, we were able to do them remotely. So going forward, if we have any issues like this and we can still have our intern program remotely. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that was a, a big adjustment that we made this year, obviously. Uh, normally, we'd like to have our interns on site. We put them into small groups and have them work on a project with uh, some team members there to help mentor them and guide them through. And we've had to adjust and do that on a remote uh, basis. So that's how we're running the internships right now. So what you can expect to have happen is uh, when, before your internship starts, we will assign you an employee ID. We will have built a laptop out to you. We'll send that to your home address. We will assign you a mentor uh, to work with during the program. And then once you get started, we'll, we'll have lots of virtual meetings using the tools that we have available to do that. And we'll, we'll guide you through the process and make the most of it. And that's an important thing that I, I want you to look for as you consider internships with companies is ask them what's the nature of the work that the interns do and ask them what the last batch of interns actually did, right? Because what I've seen is there are some companies that don't know what to do with the interns. So 
they, they have an internship, they bring them in, they assign them to a manager who's way too busy and doesn't really have time to invest and work with that person. And they end up doing weird, odd things until their internship's done. They didn't really grow or benefit and the company didn't really get a chance to see exactly what that intern's capable of. And I can tell you at FedEx, our internships are not like that. They're very different. Uh, Steve and I work very hard to make sure that they're meaningful experiences. We find opportunities where we can uh, associate a strong mentor with you and give you actual meaningful work. You're going to be building something that FedEx is going to use. Our previous, last year's interns built a, a line haul handheld application that our road drivers are using today. That's the type of experience we're going to give you and that's the type of opportunity that you're gonna to have to, to learn and see what it's about. We're also gonna expose you to different roles. So we, you know, as part of your internship, uh, you may be looking as a developer role. I'm gonna introduce you to a scrum master. I'm gonna introduce you to a product owner. Uh, different roles within an agile organization that you may not even know existed, but they may click for you. You may talk to a scrum master and go, oh, wow, that's cool. I would really like to do that, right? But we've got opportunities for those type of openings as well. So it's a great opportunity for a student to get in and learn what is it really like in, in IT and what are the different career opportunities that may exist. So this slide shows our typical uh, internship uh, program. So like for next June, right now we're accepting uh, interviews right now. Uh, typically we interview in September and October. Now we haven't actually received a batch of resumes yet. So uh, we'll be interviewing probably in October and early November. Uh, and we'll make some offers that will go out and then uh, we'll settle on those candidates and then they'll start in the June timeframe and run through August. And the, the cool thing about this is we're, we're, we'll take juniors and who are currently juniors who are going to graduate either the following December or, or May. We'll take seniors that are going to uh, graduate this May or next December. And we'll even look at uh, graduate students. Maybe you've already graduated, um, but you're looking for an opportunity to get your first job and maybe an internship is uh, the right fit for that. So we'll take in on any of those three types of students. And the cool thing is a lot of our internships end up being with full-time employment offers uh, coming out of it. And so if you're a junior in, in school this year and you apply for this, this summer internship program and we finish it up and we like you and you like us, and we extend you an offer. You could already have a, a full-time job waiting for you when you graduate, which is, you know, got to take a lot of the pressure off and, and feel good, right? If you're a senior and you go through that program, we can offer you a job immediately. Same thing if you've already graduated. Once you finish the program, we can extend it, an offer to you if it looks like a good fit. All right, here's a couple of recruiting events we've got coming up. Uh, like I talked about, these are some of those big conferences that we go to uh, to, uh, to meet new candidates. Uh, that uh, Society for Asian Scientists and Engineers actually moved their date. Uh, they're now that following Saturday. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who from our side is going to be represented there, but we'll, we'll try and get somebody to it. Uh, later in the month, we've got Society of Hispanic Professionals and Engineers. In November, that Society of Women Engineers Conference that I talked about attending last year in California. So again, these will all be virtual uh, this year. And then the, the Afrotech Conference in, uh, in mid-November. All right, here's some contact information for you. So that's uh, my email address, and Steve's email address. Uh, we're passionate about helping students get their first job and to do well in interviews, whether it's with FedEx or another company. So if there's any questions you've got after this program that you wish you'd asked, if, if you have any feedback for us on, uh, on the program or how to make it better, we would appreciate that. Uh, and to the extent it's feasible, we'll even if you've got a resume you've been working on and you're not sure if it meets the criteria Steve was talking about or not, or if it could be structured a little better, send it to us. Uh, I can't promise that we can uh, respond to them because we, we both are very busy, have a lot going on. We would like to. Uh, but obviously, if I get 500 resumes, I'm not going to be able to, to do a good job reviewing all those, getting feedback to you. But, you know, if we get a couple of them, we'd be glad to engage with you and give you some feedback on that. Of course, that wouldn't be an application. You would still, 
if you're interested in one of our openings, you would we'd want you to apply through that link that Steve shared. Uh, but we'll give you feedback on, uh, on how your resume looks. Steve or Sonia, any other thoughts for him? I, I think that you hit all of the high points that uh, we have talked about in earlier sessions. And uh, I don't have any additional information at this time. I'm just open for questions. Okay. What other questions have you guys got? What did you say the second question to ask when you're uh, inquiring about an internship? You said one was the what's the nature of the work the intern would do. What was the second one? And, and what did what did the last batch of interns do? What project did they work on? Can they tell you like I did that they built a handheld application that's being used by line haul drivers? Or are they going to not know what they did or not have a good answer to it? That would be a big clue as to whether that's a, a company that's going to invest in you as an intern or uh, or someone who's just filling a slot uh, for that time period. Luck and thank you guys so much again. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.